Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to do an overview of the biosynthesis of human pheromones. So before we go any further into this pathway and some more details here, let's differentiate a hormone from a pheromone. So a hormone, this is typically what you talk about in anatomy and physiology and even biochemistry. It's really just a chemical that travels in the blood or lymph uh, from one point in the body to another in order to exert its effect. So for example, um, epinephrine is a hormone. It's released by the adrenal medulla, which is part of the adrenal gland. It's dumped directly into the blood and it travels to a variety of target tissues all over the body. For example, the heart. And so traveling in the blood from the adrenal medulla, its source, to the heart where it exerts its effect. So that would be a hormone. Now a pheromone, in contrast, follows a similar concept except that it does not travel in the blood. So this is a chemical that travels in the air from one organism to another to exert its effects. So rather than being in the blood, pheromones are actually released by superficial structures, basically certain regions of the skin, and they travel in the air. They're airborne and they can go to certain other organisms in close proximity, and typically those pheromones are picked up by receptors in the nose. So many organisms, particularly mammals, have these receptors in their noses that are pheromone sensitive, and when the pheromone binds to the receptor, it will exert very subtle changes that can actually alter the organism's behavior. So I'll give you a good example of a pheromone. Um, in rodents, so mice and rats, the females undergo what's called an estrous cycle. This is very similar to a menstrual cycle. And in the human menstrual cycle, there's of course a certain time of a month when the female is most fertile. And that's theoretically, if you're trying to have a baby, that's when you want to have sex. In contrast, rodents have what we call an estrous cycle. And the gist of that is, very similar to the menstrual cycle, there's a time of the cycle when the female rodent is most fertile. That's theoretically when the male rodent would have sex with the female rodent. However, there's an important characteristic of the estrous cycle, and that's that during the time when the female is most fertile, she releases pheromones. Now these pheromones are released, and they travel in the air to the male rodent. So how on earth does the male rodent know when the female is fertile? Because the female is only going to be releasing those pheromones when she's fertile. So if the male is able to subconsciously detect those pheromones, then he knows the female's fertile and he will initiate mating. So that's one purpose of a pheromone, and they have a variety of other proposed effects. And it turns out that humans also make these pheromones. So we're going to look at a pretty simplistic pathway here for pheromone biosynthesis. And in this pathway, we're going to begin with pregnenolone. So pregnenolone is a direct metabolite of cholesterol. Cholesterol is the parent steroid. And cholesterol can have its long side chain, which is over here normally, cleaved off by an enzyme called cholesterol side chain cleavage enzyme. In any case, it cleaves off this big side chain and just leaves this ketone functional group right here. So this would be pregnenolone. Now pregnenolone is not a pheromone. Pregnenolone is still a hormone. Uh, the next reaction is what gives us our pheromones. So the most prolific pathway for pregnenolone would be to go into steroidogenesis where it will form testosterone, estradiol, cortisol, aldosterone, and so forth. But this is a, a lesser pathway in the sense that not as much of it is made, but it's still important. So pregnenolone can react with this enzyme right here. It's a P450 enzyme, CYP17A1. Now, it's also given a name in this context, 16-ene synthase, because the action of this enzyme is to take this now small side chain, just a ketone right here, and cleave it off. And what it essentially does is a net elimination reaction. Elimination from organic being, you have loss of a leaving group followed by formation of a double bond. You can see here in the next molecule over the product that we have a double bond here between the 16 position and the 17 position, and now this ketone is gone. So that's the action of this enzyme here. Now this enzyme, CYP17A1, is actually the same enzyme in steroidogenesis 
called uh, the 1720 lyase. And you might recognize this gene name, CYP17A1. However, it has other reactions depending on the substrate. Here, it's just going to cleave off that side chain and leave a double bond. And when you have this compound, this is really sort of the parent pheromone. All pheromones in, that we know of in humans come from this compound. This is called Androsta 516-dian-3-beta-all. Now, the numbers make this very complicated, so generally we're just going to shorten it to Androstadienol. Androstadienol. It's the musky component of underarm odor. Okay? And then Androstadienol can be converted to Androstadienone. Um, this is actually a putative male pheromone. We'll actually come back to that in a minute. But essentially, this reaction going from androstadienol to androstadienone is catalyzed by 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, also an enzyme we saw in steroidogenesis. What it does is it takes this hydroxyl group on the, on the pheromone right here, and it turns it into a ketone. You can see that. And you have a net isomerization of this double bond, and it moves over here. So you can see that. So this compound over here is androstadienone. Now, this sequence of reactions right here, these two reactions, this occurs really in two major locations. It occurs in the armpits, and it occurs in the genitals. Now, when I say the genitals, I mean either in the ovaries if you're female, or the testes if you're male. But this sequence of reactions also occurs in the axilla, the armpit. So we know that whenever you, in particular when you exercise, especially when it's the summer heat, uh, your armpits get sweaty, and if you're, especially if you're not wearing deodorant, they stink, right? There's a certain odor. Part of that odor are these two compounds right here, androstadienol, androstadienone, okay? They are both produced, and they are both found in the armpits. Now, if you are the armpits, the axilla, the pathway stops here. So the pathway does not progress beyond this in the axilla, okay? However, if you're the testes or the ovaries, the pathway will take this compound, androstadienone, and process it further, okay? So just to be clear, this is the pathway and where it stops in the axilla, or the armpit. But if I'm the testes, I'm going to take this further. Okay, so the testes have another enzyme, which is also present in steroidogenesis, called 5-alpha reductase. Now, normally what this enzyme does in the context of steroidogenesis is it takes testosterone and converts it into the far more potent dihydrotestosterone. So it does the same reaction here. It's going to take this double bond right here, androstadienone, and it's going to reduce it to an alkane. There's no double bond here anymore. This is 5-alpha androstenone. 5-alpha androstenone. This compound is also a pheromone, and it's more potent than androstadienone. So 5-alpha reductase gets rid of that double bond, and that actually increases the potency of the pheromone. In testosterone, being converted to dihydrotestosterone, that also increases the potency of the androgen. So dihydrotestosterone is a much more powerful steroid, a male steroid that is, than testosterone. Likewise, 5-alpha androstenone is a more potent pheromone than androstadienone. Okay? But this only occurs in the testes. It does not occur if you're in the axilla. Okay? Um, and actually, some fragrances for males will actually use this ingredient in it in picograms, very small amounts. Also in the testes, there's another enzyme here, 3-alpha-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which can actually take this double bond right here, this carbonyl, it's actually a ketone, and reduce it to an alcohol. Um, this forms 5-androstenol. Now, 5-alpha-androstenol is less active than 5-alpha-androstenone. Um, this is done mainly to start the metabolism of 5-alpha-androstenone, because if you make some excess of this or you don't need it anymore, you need to have a way to get rid of it. This is really the first reaction to help get rid of 5-alpha-androstenone. 5-alpha-androstenol still has some pheromone activity, but it's actually going to produce a musk-like odor as well. Okay, But this actually begins the metabolism of 5-alpha-androstenone. 
and this hydroxyl group now can be conjugated to uh, glucuronic acid or sulfates to increase its solubility and help in its excretion, probably through the urinary system. Now, if you're the ovaries, you're not going to go this direction. You're going to take this androstadienone and go down like this. And the enzyme here is called aromatase. We also saw that in steroidogenesis. Aromatase formed um, estrogens from androgens. So interesting note, uh, females make a lot of androgens. They just convert most of them to estrogens. And it's the same here with the pheromones. Uh, for females, they're going to take pregnenolone, convert it all the way to androstadienone, and then they're going to convert it to this compound called estratetraenol. And this is done through the enzyme aromatase, which again we saw in steroidogenesis, also called estrogen synthase. This occurs in the ovaries. And so really all this does is it takes this A ring of the steroid and it just aromatizes it into a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group. And so this compound would be estratetraenol. Okay. Now, I find it interesting that actually some companies, when they make some male fragrances, they'll actually put this 5 androstenone in it because it's a potent male pheromone. But for estratetraenol, there's another application of this that's actually kind of interesting. And that study is this one, Ovulatory Cycle Effects on Tip Earnings by Lap Dancers, Economic Evidence for Human Estrus. This study is sometimes referred to as the stripper study. Um, and I remember first hearing about this in a psychology class a long time ago. And so I recently looked it up and sure enough, it is real and very convincing. And basically what they did is they went to a strip club, I assume, and they looked at all the money earnings on a given night that women earned from the men. And they grouped the women into three groups. There were women who were in their menstrual phase of the menstrual cycle, women in the fertile phase of the menstrual cycle, and women in the luteal phase. Okay? Now, what did we say about the rodent estrus cycle? They're going to release these pheromones, in particular estrotetraenol, when they are fertile. That's how the male rat knows when to mate. Well, you can see by this graph, it's pretty convincing here that the women that earn the most money, that's the y-axis, the dollars earned per shift, the women that got the most money from the men were fertile. Now, why is this? Why did the women who were fertile get more money from the men? You could also ask the question, why did those men overall give more money to the fertile women? And the answer is simple. Men are pigs, but that effect is enhanced by these fertile women releasing estrotetraenol. Estrotetraenol floats through the air, it's airborne, it enters the male nose, and it has very subtle biological effects that men are not consciously aware of. They're not consciously aware that they seem to actually favor the fertile women. And so this is a really interesting study that actually um, shows some economic evidence, if you want to think about it that way, of pheromonal effects in humans. Now, do we want to go and say that humans have an estrous cycle? Maybe, maybe not. But it does suggest that pheromones, although we are not consciously aware of their effects, they do have very subtle subconscious effects. So hopefully this video gave you an interesting look into the synthesis of pheromones and some of the effects that they can actually have. It's quite an interesting topic. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.